Check, check. Okay, cool. There we go. <laughs> cool. Sweet. Hey, everyone. Today, we're going to be talking about credit scoring in Web3. And uh, yeah, I'm Ky Kerman. Kyle, yeah, we got introduced. Exactly. And how do you do this? Cool. So the current state of DeFi. There's about 4.5 million uh, act well, <laughs> active wallets right now, of which there's $60 billion in TVL and about $100 million in daily liquidation. So these sound like kind of all right numbers, but relative to 2019, where Maker hit about 10 million in uh, TVL, like the industry is growing like a tremendous amount. And when we started out, it was how do we just get a basic financial system that's predicated on smart contracts? And the idea was just to get something that works. So fast forward from 2018, 2019, we're at a much more mature place. And what we've realized is kind of going through the data that we've kind of made some fundamental assumptions about how all of this technology works that we haven't really revisited. And what we've spent a lot of the past two years doing now is really understanding this data and seeing, going back to first principles of analyzing, okay, how do we actually make a much better system than what, than what exists today? So the current state of DeFi liquidations. Typically when we see a number go down, it kind of gets bad in two ways, because number goes down, and then you have a bunch of liquidations that happen, and the liquidations cause number to go down more, and the cycle repeats. And when you have any of these DeFi platforms, such as Compound, Maker, or Aave, all the collateral types that they onboard, they have to do like pretty in-depth um, liquidity modeling with the key assumption that every single person gets liquidated. And it's a somewhat fair assumption, because in crypto, we always assume adversarial thinking, and everyone's here to do the absolute worst thing possible. So uh, that's the state right now. Kyle, do you want to add anything more to that? No, not really. It's, it's, it's a very common theme, right? Every year, markets go up, markets go down. When market goes down, everyone's, you know, whale alerts going off on Twitter. These mini wallets <laughs> got liquidated. This amount of TVL is gone, right? And, and everyone is treated the same. Um, and I want to talk about a little bit uh, an event that happened that you guys are all aware of in May. Um, let's talk about, let's go back. Let's talk about the May 2022 market crash, right? So we're talking about liquidations here. Um, internally in our risk team, we did some analysis on, you know, many different market crashes. This one particularly was interesting. So we pulled data from three places, um, from Aave, um, on both Ethereum and Polygon, and also Compound. So we took all of these um, events. There was around 18,000 liquidations. And do I? Yeah, I can sort of move the mouse here. So as you guys see on this, everyone sees this even in the back, cool. So in this circle here, um, of everyone that got liquidated, 19% of the liquidated address had a previous history of liquidations. So what does that mean? Well, that means that a fifth of all the users you know, had n a negative history. And of those 20%, almost half of them got liquidated again, right? This, that wasn't the first time. And so, and then if you look at the opposite, so the remaining 80% or 81%, only, you know, 12% of those, it was their first time being liquidated, right? But everyone is treated the same, right? Everyone gets the same rates, everyone gets the same LTV, that's just the way the market works right now, right? And so the conclusion here is, well, currently, the, minor the minority is setting the rules for the majority. There's a lot of behavior that exists on chain. You know, it's an open ledger, we can see it, but we're not using it, right? There's a lot of value that's still kind of left on chain, on many chains, right? And because of EVM, you, have the, you can use the same wallet, and so you can you know, even pass that information between chains. So there's a lot that's left on the table. And even a little caveat, um, I don't know about you guys, but Personally, when I've been liquidated in the past, I just create a new wallet, right? Whatever, new history, start over. So these numbers are probably a little worse. Um, but yeah, so let's talk about why, why we're here, the DeFi credit score, right? So there's many ways of building a DeFi credit score. Um, we've looked through, you know, using a big complicated ML model that ingests all this data and does all this, you know, heavy computation to spit out um, a quantitative value of is this person credit worthy or not? That works. We tried that out for a bit. Then we realized, well, how do you explain to someone, hey, sorry, you're getting these rates? And they say, well, why? And you say, because the model sets up. It's not, it's, you're not going to get people to embark on you know, that journey of let's use the DeFi credit score. So we wanted to 
think about that a little bit more, and we started to move towards a more algorithmic mathematical approach. So hey, I have a score of 500. Why? Because of this, because of this, because of this, because of this. That way we can communicate with the community and say, hey, what do we think should be included in a, credit, in a DeFi credit score, right? Let's talk about it. Let's make it, um, let's, let's make it interactive. Let's change the values as we see fit. You know, maybe the market goes up, the market goes down, we can adapt it, right? It's not just a black box that we can play with. So I talked about the DeFi credit score. There's five big components that we are looking at currently. Um, I'm summarizing them into five big components. Let's put it that way, okay? Um, so the first one is DeFi experience. So pretty self-explanatory. How much have you used DeFi in the past? Um, you know, which protocols, for how long, so on. History and survival, that's an interesting one. So when the markets go up and the markets go sideways, everyone's a good borrower, no problem, right? It's when the markets go down that that's when you see, hey, did you manage your position? Hey, did you pay off your debts? Did you top up? Did you completely ignore it? Right, that kind of thing. So we essentially reward people who manage their position through a downturn in the market more than the people that don't have a position at all, right? So history and survival is essentially, you get a better score if you survive during downturns in the market. Liquidations, well, self-explanatory, don't get liquidated, simple. Um, if the market's going sideways and you get liquidated, that's not good. You shouldn't, but hey, some people like to hit the max button when they borrow. I don't know what to tell you, okay. Um, uh, last, well not last, but data sources. So lots of new chains popping up, lots of new protocols popping up, lots of TVLs you know, everywhere. So we're trying to aggregate all the popular ones for now um, and then build, take all those transactions, compute them, and then create a, a score from that. So data sources, we're you know, pulling in more and more every month. Um, so that's the fourth piece. And the final piece is identity composition. I don't know about you, but me personally, I have multiple wallets for different things, right? Some that are docs together, some that are not. Um, so we, you want to be able to sign messages and say, hey, these are all part of the same identity. They should all have the same credit score. These are not, blah, 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 that, that type of stuff. So five big components to the uh, DeFi credit score. Great, we have a DeFi credit score. Awesome. What can we do with it? Right? So the first thing that we decided to do with the DeFi credit score is provide better capital efficiency on our platform. So what do I mean by capital efficiency? Well, better use of your capital, right? If you currently go on Compound, you go on Aave, I think you get 80% LTV. The interest rates change depending on their, their algorithms, different things like that. Um, so better borrowing on ArcX. That's what we're doing now. So we want to provide, based on the credit score, right, a mapping of favorable borrow rates, right? Hey, you just starting? That's fine. You get market rates, right? Everyone, you know, the market's been pretty good at, you know, saying if you're a new borrower or you're just coming into the space for the first time, you get market rates, right? Everyone gets market rates. But if you've been in the market for a while, maybe you get a little bit more favorable because we know we, we can trust that wallet address. If this wasn't obvious, it's DeFi, there's, there's no KYC, there's no AML, there's no none of that. It's crypto native. Second thing, well, um, so better borrowing rates is, you know, uh, interest rates and that kind of stuff on your debt. Loan to value ratio, well, you get more bang for your buck as you deposit collateral. And just to emphasize, we offer 100% LTV loans if you have a really good credit score. So these are near basically one-to-one -one loans, something that's r never really been done in crypto before. So it's not like we're trying to push this just a little. We're pushing this to the point of just collateralized loans. And once we get an even better understanding of like how to quantify the financial value of an identity, we'll probably be able to do truly under collateralized loans, scaled via algorithms and no human intervention or risk assessment. So, but yes, yeah, carry on. Exactly, yeah, exactly. And, and especially, you know, if you value your credit worthiness, well, there's, that's inherent value, right? That you can leverage on top of the collateral that you deposit. So, you know, for me personally, as a personal anecdote, if I have a, you know, 999 credit score, like, I'm going to do everything I can to protect that. Because if I get liquidated, like, I can't forge time, right? I can't go back and, you know, undo the last two years. I can't redo the last two years of perfect borrowing, right, to get these better rates. So, yeah, there's more stuff, too, you know, like borrowing against exotic assets and all that stuff. You guys get the idea. So, better borrowing is great, but this inherently comes with lots of risk. So, let's talk about that. Yeah. Risk, it's something that we get asked a lot about, especially when creating a credit score, because as we've seen with this entire bear market, uh, a lot of people haven't managed their risk correctly. 
So a lot of what we do is, first of all, understanding how much leverage a user takes and looking at like the reasons why they've taken it. The great, when, whenever I talk about credit scoring to people, they say, what if you game the system? But you can never game the future prices, which is the best fit about this. So understanding a user's uh, relationship to leverage is something we spend a lot of time on. The second really big bit is profit modeling. So when we're offering one-to-one -one loans, uh, we, we, there's still a liquidation penalty of anywhere between three to five percent. So we do make a loss on those liquidations, but we've done our modeling in a way where we mathematically always make money. So making sure that profit modeling uh, bit is really important for us. The third bit is around decentralization and censorship resistance. How do we make sure that the computation we do sticks to the like values and ideals of crypto? And then real interest rates, there's no Ponzi-nomic behavior, there's no token that you earn, there's no like back doors, none of that stuff. Um, and last of all, it's just like always ba balancing between the incentives of over collateralized and under collateralization. So there's a lot within risk that we've taken a lot of time to understand. We spent about one and a half, two years understanding this. I've personally been in DeFi since the birth of it in 2018. I've seen every platform, every situation play out. So it's, we're not going into this with uh, a lot of naivety. Um, yeah, Colin, anything you want to add to that? No, 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 not done really. I mean, risk is, risk is an ever ongoing challenge, right? Just when you think you know it all, something new happens, a new, you know, a new stable coin gets depegged. Who knows, <laughs> right? Like, like things are constantly evolving. So this isn't a once and done, you understand you're good. It's a constant, constant thing that we always want to wanna work on and improve. Yeah, so just to summarize, we've got liquidation parameters are set by the minority in DeFi today. We want to create a world in which everything is set via your credit score personalized to you and your behavior. And eventually this unlocks a lot more capital and credit for the entire ecosystem, which allows us to better understand risk. And of course, uh, there's a lot of technical challenges with enabling this on-chain identity slash reputation layer. And that's about it. We want to call it here because we'd love to hear questions from you guys. So great, great talk. Just um, one question. So in some protocols, what you can do is you can um, do a like, um, um, you can ask for money and uh, you can you can deposit and then ask for zero, mm -hmm. right? So uh, for instance, liquidity allows you to put the collateral and then ask for uh, as little as you want, even zero. Mm -hmm. But that means that the score will be high because that, that will be impossible to liquidate. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that means like if you have like you create 100 wallets, you create 100 zero positions that will be never liquidated, they will accumulate good race, uh, uh, credit score over, over the time. Is, is it something that you consider when? Uh, Absolutely. How the amount of money that, that uh, a user borrows? Yeah. yeah so, first. Oh, you go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. So there's two uh, solutions to this problem. The first is there's an active component of the score, which looks at the debt utilization of the collateral you've deposited. So if you're borrowing, if you deposit $100 and then you're borrowing $1 of debt, your credit score is going to grow by a very small amount per day. Then to the second leg of your question of like, okay, what if I get a dollar and put it across 100 wallets? Your uh, credit limit is only going to be set to about like three or four dollars because the systems learn that hey, you're a small player, you deal with small amounts of money. What's a credit limit, Kerman? I, have, oh, I don't yes. know what this is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so credit limit basically algorithmically look at the average bar amount that your wallet uses, and we're only going to give you that much credit that you've actually been accustomed to handling. It's just like a bank in the real world. If you're borrowing ten dollars from the bank and then you say, hey, give me a million dollars, they're going to be like, no, fuck off. Like. <laughs> It's the same thing here. Yeah, exactly. Like in in your example of you know, if I take a hundred dollars, right? If if you don't borrow at all, your score's not going to move. Period. Mm -hmm. Right? Like you're not using your credit, so why would your credit score move? It won't. Um, and to Kerman's point with the credit limits, like that's how we alleviate with risk, right? If in the same example, you could have one person take $100 in one wallet, manage it at like the perfect optimal borrow rate, get to 999, and then put in millions of dollars in leverage like crazy. Well, no, we won't let them do that because you've only proven that you can you know, properly handle $100. So maybe we'll give you 
We'll give you more than $100, obviously, but you won't be able to like, leverage out and take millions. So. All right, yes. and one, one simple question. Why are liquidations bad in your, in your model? Why aren't it, they bad? Yeah, why, why, why you penalize liquidations? So I so, think it's actually the opposite with our model. We try to encourage people not to get liquidated. Our business model relies on people not being liquidated because we believe in long-term games with long-term people. A lot of, if you look at Mac, Maker, Aave, Compound, a lot of their revenues are driven by their liquidations set by higher liquidation penalties. So we try to minimize the liquidation penalties because we believe if we all, the game of lending is I give you something valuable and then you give me cash in return. And the more we can play that game cooperatively together, the more credit and value we can create for people over, over the long run. So a lot of our ethos and philosophy is built around that way. Um, and we only penalize liquidations because we want to reinforce to people, don't get liquidated, manage your debt, so that we can create more uh, credit collectively. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No problem. Cool, any other questions? There's no dumb questions, I promise. Yeah. <laughs> we've, we've heard all the, all the questions possible. Like, you know, on the, on the point of, of uh, liquidations, like, there's, there's when, the, when a liquidation occurs, right, like, someone wins, right? Most of the time, it's the liquidator, right? They get a fee for maintaining the system and all that kind of stuff. And we want to, like Kerman said, it's part of our ethos to not require, hey, it's me against you. It's borrower versus lender. It's who can extract the most value out of who, out of who right? So... That's why we're trying to say no, instead of everyone just hating each other, let's all kind of like cooperate a little bit, figure out, hey, you're a trustworthy person. You know, so now the lenders can decide, hey, well, I'd rather lend to a higher risk person and get, you know, take on more risk for more, more value, or no, you know, I don't want to lend to high risk people, I want to lend to lower risk people and get a more stable, lower risk return on, on, my, on my capital. And yeah, so just an extra little point on liquidations. I don't think I quite understand. So you're saying liquidators bring liquidators bring liquidity? Yeah, bring bring something basically. Bring money when the when the price is high. Mm -hmm. Well so I think uh, personally liquidations mostly are all flash loans, so they don't actually bring in any liquidity liquid liquidity. Is that what you mean? Because like like we have our own liquidator and like different things like that that we use. We don't actually hold any capital yeah. for the liquidator. But, yeah, but, but the liquidator will keep something. Of course, yes, and and that's the incentive for him to maintain the system. Yeah. And that's something. It's funny. The price of that thing is going down. Mm -hmm. well, the liquidator is, is actually you know, taking a big risk because if that thing, if the price of that thing will go down, uh, lower and lower. They don't take risk though, because this is executed atomically via flash loans. So, yeah. in a single transaction, they're repaying the debt, selling the collateral for dollars, and are completely hedged. So, they don't actually take on risk. These are typically very sophisticated uh, bots that are running, and have like perfected this down to a science and raking millions of dollars when the market tanks. Yeah. And so then, and they're very good at front running too. Correct, <laughs> <laughs> as we've learned. Um, I think we had a question here. Yeah. So, so how? What is your business model? Yeah, for sure. sure. Uh, we take a cut on the interest rates primarily. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Sorry? On the better rate that you... On the interest rate from the debt that you're effectively borrowing. Yeah, exactly. And usually, like, we're still discussing with the community on, you know, and internally about the exact, like, numbers and the spreads and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, the better the credit score, then the better the rates, right? It's usually... That's kind of how, how this works, right? Like, if, if, if someone's building up their score and, you know, they've proven that they're very credit worthy, then they're, they're going to pay next to nothing, right? All right, there's a question here. Uh, are you looking, and I, I see you guys, because uh, <laughs> we're in a similar sort of space. Um, are you looking at, like, partnering with, like, Morpho and, like, Compound and, you know, other lending borrowing protocols, protocols to, to provide, like, your scoring mechanism to give users a better experience? Or basically, how are you thinking about like your go-to-market? Like, or are you kind of trying to build your own and then have your own kind of ecosystem? Because uh, I just know you guys from the scoring aspect, but it'd be cool to see hear about how you're trying to like make it more accessible. Yes, yeah, so we've been built our own lending borrowing market itself, um, and we're integrating it directly into that. But 
Uh, we've also built this like very sophisticated data capability. So if there's any other protocols that are down to collaborate, um, that's like definitely avenues that we're uh, keen to explore as well. But our primary go-to-market is through our own lending borrowing protocol. Yeah. Hey, so thank you for the talk. Uh, I have one question. You mentioned that newcomers to, to the space get market rates. Mm -hmm. Have you considered uh, bridging their like real-world credit scores to offer them uh, an advantage when joining? It's kind of something that like a lot of other people are trying to do, but in my view, like any time, philosophically, I believe the on-chain world is very different to the real world. And as soon as you try and bridge between the two, it creates a very suboptimal experience because you're relying on trust guarantees of like some lawyer in like some random like U.S. Delaware state. So uh, that whole thing, like it, it's just not that appealing. There's a lot of companies trying to do stuff like that, um, but ultimately, I think it's more of as more things happen on chain, um, that history will be quicker and better to build. So, uh, yeah, it's there's no perfect answer right now, but like compromising to like saying, hey, give us your iris scans and we'll give you better rates. Is <laughs> that something we're about? <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it, like you can have to pick a side, right? It's like either you go the hey, we're gonna KYC, we're gonna get your you know real world stuff and try to bring it on chain. We're going the route of no, you don't need to tell us who you are. We just need an EVM address or an address, an identifier of some kind, right? Um, which one's better? Time will tell. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Are you going to cluster addresses? Because maybe at some point, a, <clears throat> an address, mm -hmm. imagine that I have an illness, and at some point, people will die or <laughs> in, in the sense that at some point I have a high risk score, a high credit score, mm -hmm. and maybe the best way for me to get a big party in the end of my life will be to screw the system by asking a big loan sure. mm -hmm. and don't reimburse it because yep. it's the end of my uh, Journey on this life in the sense sure, that yeah, yeah, in your example, so yeah, yeah. if you don't cluster addresses, let's say oh, oh, if, if if this is not linked somehow to other things, maybe a scammer will be able in the end to make profit of it. I mean, it's yeah, that's a way because the long con essentially, right? How do you like, per, like basically do a long con and then screw the system at the end? Hmm. So our solution to that is, I think a lot of crypto native people like this idea of like civil resistance of like how do you prevent multiple wallets from like gaming a system or one wallet from gaming the system to the last point in time. And our answer is like very rational. We just care about the math. We look at the profit. We look at the potential losses. And as long as the math stacks up correctly, sure, like we know the del delinquency rate. We can model everything out. And as long as our systems stay positive with a margin of error, it doesn't really matter. Um, but we don't have any under collateralized loans at this point in time, so that's not really a risk that we run. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank cool. Kyle. Thank Kerman. All right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank